Now, of course, uh, we called Dr. Akshana Mehran to do all the proceedings for the day. And of course, as you know, as usual, that my presentation is followed by uh, my mentor, uh, my guiding uh, guru, we call in our uh, language, our Indian language, Dr. Valentin Fuster, who has been right uh, with me since 1988-89 when I came as a fellow in Mount Sinai and has always guided me to do the right thing and uh, propel my career. Dr. Fuster, thank you very much. Dr. Second, Anna, though, yeah. I want to introduce Dr. Fuster. Sorry, Dr. Fuster, I know you don't like all these introductions, but I have to. First of all, let me just, a couple of things. The room is packed, it's fantastic. We have a lot more room on this side and another screen. All the faculty are invited to be, we have reserved faculty space, so please come up and sit in your designated seats so it opens seats for our other people. Well, I also was a fellow at Mount Sinai in 1991 and met Dr. Fuster as my very, very first supporter and an incredible mentor. Who is Dr. Fuster? Who doesn't know Dr. Fuster? But let me, let me just tell you, he is the Mount Sinai uh, Medical Hospital physician in chief, and he truly is a physician in chief. I don't think just for Mount Sinai, but I think for the world of cardiology. I really believe in that. He's president of the Mount Sinai Heart Center and the general director of the National Center for Cardiovascular In Investigation, that's CINIC, a very similar sort of NIH of the United States. CINIC is the NIH of Spain, so imagine that. He's the director in Madrid. He's the past president of the American Heart Association, the World Heart Federation. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. He's chaired the committees for the most important documents, promotion of cardiovascular health worldwide, and presently he co-chairs the advisory committee on the role of the United States in global health. So imagine what all of this is. He's obviously has been named um, several, he has so many awards, gold medals from pretty much everyone, AHA, ESC, et cetera, Dr. Honoris Cosa, over 33 universities. I was, I felt like, oh my God, I got one, but he's got 33, authored more than 1,200, 1,500 manuscripts, highest H index of any cardiologist in the world. And of course, he is the editor in chief and the innovator of our journal of the American College of Cardiology, Jack, that started at Mount Sinai by Simon Dack. Everyone should understand that. And it's come back to its home. And for the last 10 years, he's led Jack to the top of, its, of the heads. I mean, incredible. I know he doesn't want me to keep going because I can go on and on. But most importantly, Dr. Fuster is truly one of the most humble, kindest, and personable card cardiologists, but human beings in the world that I know. He, personally, he's taken care of my family, and it really is a true honor to have him always inaugurate this particular meeting with his brilliant lecture, and now his ideas that might have seemed a little crazy to many people in the past when he presented them 20 years ago and has kept on to them in thinking about promoting health at the time of a child in, in childhood and now talking about very, very important programs that he's leading with silent progression of arterial disease, age-dependent programs, and the new technologies. Dr. Fuster, it's such an honor to have you here with us and to open the lecture with your keynote lecture. Welcome, Dr. Fuster. <clears throat> I frankly feel overwhelmed by, <clears throat> by this introduction. Thank you very much to both of you, <clears throat> and uh, I really appreciate. It is a pleasure to be in this meeting actually every year. It seems that what I want to do is to prevent what you are doing. <clears throat> I have been working in the uh, issue of silent disease for some time. Uh, a, a, a program on three different ages and with new technologies. It is interesting because in the last session last year, I have a similar title, a link between the heart and the brain, new data on the young. Today is new data on the elderly. 
And it's very fascinating what is actually happening. <clears throat> what happened is for many years we have been working in the bottom of the slide, that is, what is disease, uh, particular arterial disease. We are now working on the top of the slide. <clears throat> number one, how the disease develops. And number two, three different ages. Uh, the situation is quite different. Number three, quite importantly, is new technology. You cannot even try to understand health if you are not using new technology. Well, with this in mind, what I'm going to show to you is uh, three aspects that are in middle age that actually have led us to really very interesting findings in the elderly population. Now, first of all, the three aspects are the following. Number one, we are using 2D and 3D ultrasound to assess both carotid arteries, the aorta and both iliofemoral arteries. And then we use calcification, an indirect approach, to understand if there is coronary artery disease or not. And actually, as we mentioned before, the disease surprisingly starts in the legs, in the iliofemoral region, in about 80% of people. Now, having said that, what is most striking is that when we look at the three panels on the left, these are males, in the middle, two-thirds of them actually have already silent disease between age 40 and age 55. This is the PESA study of 4,000 individuals. Now, I will tell you that now the data that we have, the recent data is that the disease begins at age 20. We can already see it with ultrasound in one of the segments that I mentioned. In women on the right, 50% of women under age of 50 have already uh, such disease. If you go to the bottom of the slide, the disease, pro we are following these people for 20 years. And in about three years, 33% of people have already progressed in the ultrasound or the ca calcification, as I mentioned. And the question is, what makes the disease to progress? And we have the data, it's not published yet, but I will tell you, LDL cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes are real drivers of this progression of the disease that we find by ultrasound at a relatively young age. <clears throat> Number two, this is very new. This was published just a few weeks ago. We went back to the cardiac study. No, can you go back, please? The cardiac study were people between age 20 to 40 who a number of risk factors were present. And what we decided to do is to measure in the abscissa the years, you can see in the top left is LDL, and in the ordinate how the LDL fluctuates. And when you measure that area, the question is what happened 30 to 40 years later? This is very important because it's a unique study of a long follow-up. And on the right is HDL triglycerides, and then we have blood pressure and so forth. And the results are very striking. For example, LDL cholesterol, the red line, you know what that means? That the area of disease between age 20 to 40, in this case, is not disease, it's risk factor. LDL has a huge impact in the long follow-up of these people. You have triglycerides, blood pressure, and so forth. And what I am just trying to say to you is that the risk factors at young age have much more impact an LDL at age 35, that an LDL at age 50 or 55. We have the data, I don't have time to present it. So we have to pay attention to the younger age. That's point number two. And the point number three is very striking, and that is what could we consider normal is abnormal. Look at the, the first on the left, you have basically LDL cholesterol. And you say, what is the normal range? If you go to guidelines, you, then, you never had a problem is between 80, 100, 120. Forget it, there is a clinical disease unless you have an LDL less than 70 or 60 milligrams DL. Well, you say, eh, this is LDL, but what about the other things? Well, hemoglobin A1C, we just published this. Hemoglobin A1C, you say, is an, is a, in a way, is an alarm system for diabetes. You put this in green, it's not just an alarm. Well, it's not an alarm. The disease is already there. But something very striking, we all tabulated these risk factors, and, and, uh, and, and Stuart Poco has been very helpful in all of this. 
what happened here? The hemoglobin A1c is actually lower than even 5.7. And this led to the data that we just obtained that is very fascinating, is insulin resistance. So basically, before the hemoglobin A1c goes up, the patient is releasing insulin to overcome the problem. And we find already disease even before the hemoglobin A1c is actually at the pre-diabetic state. And this is the data that we are going to publish soon, which is basically we quantify insulin resistance. And you can see this is even bef below the hemoglobin A1c being in the pre-diabetic state. So what I'm really saying to you that we are in big trouble by not thinking into what is happening subclinically. And the guidelines are absolutely primitive, in my view, at this point, because it's all based on heart attacks, strokes, but not in subclinical disease. Well, this led to the pre-cut study that we are ready to start now, which is basically the three aspects that I mentioned. The disease starts at a, at a young age. Risk factors at a young age are really a problem, and what we consider normal is abnormal. Young people between age 20 and age 39 years, LDL cholesterol more than 70 means abnormal. Active treatment versus standard of care. What we are going to do is to look at the progression of disease. And just to give you a sense of the trial, this is basically already an LDL higher than 70. We are going to use glycerin subcutaneously because most of these people who accept to be on a trial between age 20 and 40 have significant risk factors like familial hypercholesterolemia. You cannot start getting patients out of the blue at age 25 with statins and so forth. So that's the reason why this is the study. Well, I think what I presented to you are three aspects that led us to what I think is most important in my presentation today. What this all means when you reach age 60 to 100. And three aspects I'm going to present are quite interesting. I think this is quite striking. We got the data three weeks ago. And basically we have, at this moment, we have about 6,000 people that had imaging between age 60 and age 100, ultrasound. This is the bioimage study that we follow for a long time and what we did is, what is the burden of disease subclinically and what this means on events? These are older people. We are now looking with events at older age. And this is very striking. Actually, this is the red line means more significant burden of disease when the patients were imaged before and what happened with mortality later on. And I will tell you the following. All of us talk about risk factors. And I can say one thing, very important at young age. But if you want to have a real risk factor, is to identify the disease subclinically. This is, for us, the most important risk factors of all. And this is why imaging that is not injecting anything subclinically is coming out in the field. And this will be completely standardized within the next year or two. So this is the first point we find in the elderly. And that is, if you assess the disease with ultrasound, you can predict what is going to happen. And this is in the right, by the way, is calcium score, which is also very significant. Point number two, what about the brain? All these technologies I, pre I am presenting to you, we have moved into the brain with MRI, PET, and so forth, cognitive function, and so forth. And let me explain to you what was the original hypothesis. I'm talking about 2020. This is a TANSNIP study between New York and Madrid. And basically, we wanted to have individuals between age 45 and age 60. And the question was, is those individuals who have risk factors or large vessel disease, which is what I presented, are developing microvascular disease of the brain? This pathological data suggesting that. If there is microvascular disease of the brain, can we quantify with MRI? And all of those, those of you who are on imaging know what I'm talking about. This is quantifiable today, the uh, flow in the brain. The second issue is, if there is a decreased flow in the brain with all this risk factor profile and disease in the large arteries, do we have less uptake of glucose in the brain? So we use positive emission tomography. And the third is, if the uptake of glucose is decreased, is cognitive function affected and senile dementia evolved? And even further, 
Geen Alzheimer's disease, as Alzheimer's said 100 years ago, part of the disease, the progression is due to vascular disease. Well, we address all of these, and let me present to you the data. On the first issue about cerebral blood flow on people who had hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, or diabetes, we have actually at the 96 people, and we saw decreased flow in the brain if at least two of these risk factors were present. And do you know, this is very quantifiable. This is in yellow. It's a decrease in blood flow in the brain by MRI under a risk factor profile has not been taken care at younger age. Point number two, again, this is a very fascinating. What we did is positive emission tomography, and that is if there is decreased flow and the risk factor profile of the individual gets worse and worse, this is this, what happens with glucose uptake in yellow? It significantly decreased. And this is number three, what happens if there is hypoperfusion of the brain, less uptake of glucose, what about cognitive function by the Oxford standardized method, so-called MOCA, significantly problematic. This is lack of perfusion in yellow. So we began to see something that was really very, very important, but even further, we are following now 2,000 people, family people of Alzheimer's disease. And we have an animal model, and I don't have time to address this today, but it's a fascinating study in which what we are finding is in the mouse model of Alzheimer's, actually in the microvascular, as these animals develop Alzheimer's, there is microvascular thrombosis. And you know what it is? It's amyloid B, beta, is prothrombogenic. And actually we have given antithrombotic agents, this is all published, and decreased the progression of Alzheimer's disease in the animal model. Some of this is just published a week ago in the, uh, in the, in the uh, British Journal of Pharmacology. So even Alzheimer's is a disease of the neuron. There's probably a lot to do with the progression, with disease in the microvasculature. The question is, are the risk factors leading to the problem, as I mentioned a minute ago, or is just a problem of clotting? Well, I, nothing is perfect in research. The patients I presented to you, the individuals I presented to you in the Tanzanib study, not all had the same technologies. So in fact, what we build the hypothesis, some have the microcirculation quantification, some had the positive emission tomography, and we pull it all together. But what about if we do this prospectively? And this leads to the trial that we started a year ago, prospective heart-brain access. And basically, what we are doing in this study is that in a thousand individuals, all the technologies that I presented are done. The MRI quantification of flow, the positive emission tomography, clock uptake, and the cognitive function. And this trial already started. We already have 200 individuals on the study. And uh, the data I can tell you is fascinating, and I cannot go much further, but I won't tell you the following. What you see here in color are new biomarkers that are like troponins in the heart. And when we talk about ischemia, we talk about troponins. Now, with a group in Amsterdam, we already have biomarkers that tell you ischemia of the brain. And these are here. And this is going to be fascinating because any kind of minor injury of the types that I described will be possible to be uh, looked at by biomarkers in the blood telling us that the patient is at risk. Well. All of these things that I presented to you about MRI and so forth, you will say, well, and so what? Well, just read science this week. They point out everything I mentioned to you, and that is the heart-brain connection. This is a real issue. And the issue is all the risk factors that take place at younger age are beginning to affect the brain, to the point that when we see these patients that say, you know, doctor, you are a torture. I don't want to stop smoking. I don't want to lose weight. All those things you tell me, I want to die suddenly. Well, when you tell these people, what about your brain that is slowly may lose power, they change drastically. I'm telling you the most practical comment I can make of what we are finding is the disease that we usually talk about, the heart and the large arteries, the risk factors are affecting the brain. And I'm showing this to you. This is all new data. And I think it's very important. And I'd like to finish by presenting to you something. 
that I'm quite excited, and you might be skeptical, but let me present it. We have this study that was uh, published a year ago, which we did in thousands of these people, 900, we did positron emission tomography of the large arteries, like we do ultrasound, but also the bone marrow. And here you have activity of the bone marrow that actually it translates into this yellow thing in the large artery, which is a word that we consider between the macrophage or the monocyte from the bone marrow and the cholesterol that is deposited in the artery. And now comes the concept. I'm very excited about the concept. I may be wrong, but let me go over. We are doing a lot of studies with this. I remember 45 years ago when I began to talk about the platelet, I could only go to hematological conferences because the cardiologists didn't even pay attention to it. At that time, nobody knew if the clot was the cause of MI or the consequence. The platelet was very much left aside. I can guarantee to you that we are going to talk about the bone marrow in the next few years as we are talking today about the platelet when we talk about disease of the arteries. Let me present to you the issue. What I think is happening is in these 900 people, we have these plaques, which is the component of monocytes and actually cholesterol deposition. And with MRI, we see when the lesion actually heals and stabilizes, this is fibrotic. So what we are doing now is we see how a substrate that is a war in yellow turns out, if there is no much substrate, into a healing phenomena with actually with MRI. That's number one. And this is acceptable. The question is, if the individual continues to have significant risk factors and the content of cholesterol in the artery is very significant, what happens? The monocyte from the bone marrow commits suicide. And this is called apoptotic phenomena. And during apoptosis, it releases metalloproteinases, may break the plaque, uh, tissue factor, may lead the clot, cytokines, and so forth. And I think this is what an acute coronary syndrome is all about, is a failure of a defense mechanism in which there is very active component, which is the macrophage in the artery, in that vulnerable plaque, that when decides to suicide, releases the worst components that you like to see, metalloproteinases and tissue factor. And let me go back to COVID-19 for a moment. In COVID-19, those patients who are in the in the hospital, but have to be admitted in the intensive units. You know what is happening. We know today is a huge problem of apoptotic phenomena from the macrophages who cannot take care of the virus because the density of the virus and the activity is much more powerful. And then there is this phenomena of cytokine release, clots in the lungs, and all the things that we see that the patient needs intubation. I'm only presenting to you one biological concept that is critical, that whenever there is a foreign body, the bone marrow reacts. And the question is, who wins the war? And this is the real question. And to me, the acute coronary syndrome is actually this issue. But what this has to do with the elderly, and this comes the concept of CHIP, very interesting concept. The story of CHIP is the following. In fact, we participated on the first study in 2017. These cells from the bone marrow may be mutated. If you have a defense cell that has all the mutations that can affect the defense mechanism, what is the final result? Bad news. Well, this is the concept of CHIP. Today we know, and we have a large study, that 25% of adult people over age of 65 have mutations of the cells in the bone marrow that are supposed to defend you. Now, and the question is, what is the most important mutation is TT2. And actually, what happened is, let me go into the Cantos study. Basically, when there is a lesion that is very significant, plaque that is rupturing or some degree of, of thrombus, very vulnerability, interleukin-1 of monocytes that circulate in blood recognize that there is trouble in this segment of the artery. Monocytes type 1 are actually a call from the bone marrow, and they come in. You know what these monocytes do? They are so significantly, in a way, they clean the artery so much that they may lead to a coronary event. And that's the reason why, in my view, and actually uh, Paul Ritker and Peter Levy and so forth are in agreement that the antibody, what he's doing is actually is blocking interleukin-1. The color to the bone marrow 
to do this travel. What TET2 is, TET2 is doing the same thing. It's preventing the monocytes type 1 to be too aggressive. So if you have a bone marrow cell that is supposed to defend you, going into where the substrate of cholesterol is, that is mutated, this doesn't happen. And we believe that this is one of the most important risk factors of the elderly population that develop syndromes, acute coronary syndromes, without obvious risk factors otherwise. And I will tell you the following. We believe that when we talk about genetics of cardiovascular disease, a site of hyperlipidemia, familial, and so forth, we are talking about the process that I'm mentioning to you. And that is your defense mechanism that you're supposed to have in health. It doesn't work when you are at these ages. And therefore, you may have an acute coronary syndrome without having necessarily to say that you have other risk factors. So I just want to finish by saying that next year, I want to come back if they invite me to talk about this because the future is children and is education. I don't want to get into this. I'm working with 50,000 children around the world now, just pointing out that their young age, they capture everything you tell them and it comes out later on. And this is very well proven in the neurophysiological circles and so forth. So remember how you are today and just go back to when you were age three to seven, eight, when there are very small number of receptors in the brain, everything you get there is a store and comes back later on. Much more different than when you are an adult. We have many centers and everything gets in and out and there is not that specific capture of the brain. So we are working on this and I will be happy to talk next year about this. But I'd like just to finish by saying to you the following. What I presented to you, frankly, is very motivating, certainly to us. And uh, I presented three concepts that begin at young middle age. And the first concept is the subclinical plaque that in a study we just finished in Harlem, New York, we know it starts at age 20. Now that's number one. Then the risk factors at young age have so much power into what is going to happen later in life. The guidelines completely ignore that. They start at age 40 with a Framingham and whatever kind of a score you, you talk about it. And that's number two. Number three, what we consider normal is completely abnormal. So we are treating our patients with what we consider normal is okay. Hemoglobin A1C, yes, is an alarm. You know, don't worry about this pre-diabetes. Let's take care. It's much more complex than that. These are the three issues that are in, rather in the middle age. And then we go into the older age. In the recent data I presented, actually, you, Roxana, participated in the first study of the bioimage. It's fascinating. And that is when you start imaging people at age 60, you can predict by that imaging what is going to happen in mortality later on is 13 years later. And that's what we did in our 6,000 study. It has not been published yet. And as I mentioned, this was just, we got the data three weeks ago. And that's number one in the elderly. The disease, when you see it, is a very important risk factor. The second issue is the risk factors may lead to degenerative brain disease and perhaps the acceleration of Alzheimer's. This is a very important, and again, the article of science this week emphasizes this on the technology of MRI. This is the technology that they're actually emphasizing. In number three, we have the elderly. Uh, well, we have risk factors that we think that those defense mechanisms that we have in health may be the key of risk factors or of, of disease or of events later on. And I mentioned, for example, the apoptotic phenomena of the macrophage when there is too much cholesterol and the cell kills itself by releasing these metalloproteinases and tissue factor. And I finish by talking about CHIP, and that is the cells from the bone marrow are not appropriately healthy, and this is a significant risk factor in the elderly. So I finish here by saying to you, look, it's a pleasure to be here today, and I am always I'm very excited about working in subclinical disease and trying to understand health, because we know more about disease than we know about health. Thank you very much for this opportunity.